I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I feel necessary to tell you who we are because this is going out all over the world on the internet. We live stream every Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, and we get response from Australia and from Holland and from Germany and India and Africa, all throughout Africa. And people respond, and they love the message we teach. We're located just about 15 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee. And we're uh, on the lake out here. I'm, I'm, I'm not on the lake. This is a lake town. When those big stars get their hit records or some big mogul gets his big money, they come out here to buy a lake home. And a lake lot just with no house on it is going to run a million and a half to two million dollars for an acre lot. And uh, they are super high. And then they got to put them a two or three million dollar house on it. So we don't exactly rub elbows with the stars, but once in a while I'll see one of the old stars on the street. You wouldn't recognize them, but I would. And uh, I don't particularly like stars. Anyway, when we meet, we've we had a kind of a special meeting this week. Uh, people flew in, and boy, are their arms tired. <laughs> That's an old ancient joke. I shouldn't have been using that. That's corn. That's corniest, corniest Kellogg's cornflakes. Anyway, anyway, we have several people that have come here, and I want them to come up here and give a testimony as to where they're from, what motivated them to listen to this truth and how they felt when they heard it, and give a little bit of their background. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Lee from England to come up here first. And you don't have to, this is not formal, just say whatever is on your mind. You can come on up here, and I'll take my microphone off, and you can talk into this. This is Lee Graham from England. And he's got a strange way of talking. <laughs> not to me, it's not. Um, not yeah, to me, well, it's not. Where do, I, where do I start, Jim, to condense um, my life into um, you were listening, listening to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, yeah, I was brought up with the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church and um, full of the rituals. I love them. And <laughs> I, love them. I, I thought it was all, you know, a great big part of, you know, Roman Catholicism was, you know, it was powerful. It was, you know, they was talking about Jesus. They was talking about salvation. I just had no idea. Yeah. And until, you know, uh, my pilgrimage carried on, I started to um, see through the word um, the truth. Yeah. And God was giving me, you know, the truth through the Word. Where and did you hear the truth first? Well, I didn't necessarily hear it. I see it in the Bible. Oh, and I, okay. I you start, reading the Bible. I started to, you know, piece different parts of, you know, explanations came into my life of what was actually going on because, you know, I don't really want to, like, give a full explanation of, of the iniquities, but it's just the same as anyone else. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've just, I've seen the same as everyone else, so... Um, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, surprisingly enough, you know, the outer man is there. Um, so, um, so I, I came across you a few years ago, and you, I've met many different pastors of you know globally that have come to Britain and, and, and spoke you on. said they don't think over there like we think here tell them about that Baptist preacher you talked to I, I, I in my career I do fire protection and um, a lot of our customers are all of the denominations yeah. from the Baptist to Islam and I always when I go into religious um, premises I, I generally end up speaking um, and witnessing. Yeah. So um, in this particular particular church, a Baptist church, <laughs> uh, 
of the particular Baptists, um, I, I was working and, um, you know, doing my job, being reserved like, you know, the British way is. And, um, and, and he sort of befriended me. He said, you know, I'd like you to come along to the church and, you know, fellowship with us. And um, I knew, obviously, at this time that, you know, water baptism, I didn't believe in it. So... Um, I said, but well, it's very nice of you to, to offer, but um, I don't believe in what you believe in. You know, and he looked at me as though to say, well, I've never heard that one before. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I can be a bit abrasive in some areas, but um, I probably could have said it a bit nicer. Um, but he, um, he was quite interested, and, and it got into quite a deep conversation of the, um, I just, you know, I wasn't interested. You know, I, 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 I can't... You talked to him about a priest I, I, um, or about the Catholics or something? I, I, well, I, I spoke to him, you know, about their rituals themselves. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, that's the reason why I left the, the Roman Catholic Church because I was just sick of the water rituals. You know, I, I knew that the, the, the water rituals through reading the Bible was, was just, it was just a ritual. You know, the rituals have been nailed to the cross, so it yeah. becomes spiritual. Jesus, you know, doesn't refer to the, the rituals in the way, not to us Gentiles anyway, he did to the Jews, but it's a different story, I'm not a Jew. So, you know, the way I, I see it is, um, is that all the rituals are nailed to the cross and it's spiritual, it's a blood baptism, you know, what you speak about. Yeah. Um, is it's it's that's the way it is. It's it's. You ask the preacher if he thought these Catholics were Christians. Well, right. I, I'm, that's yeah. That I mean, to see the thing is, Jim. I, this this preacher guy. Um, it's it's going over a, a few guy. years of um, of of conversation. So it's not just sort of like a twenty minute. Yeah. conversation here is we go back there and I, I speak to him more and the more I've spoke to him the more that he's got contentious with me yeah. because I don't you know he was quoting scriptures to me and I was saying well you know there's one Lord one faith one baptism you know there's one baptism there's not two and Jesus always refers to generally in the New Testament to that one baptism yeah you know the rituals is irrelevant now it's they've ceased the gifts have ceased so um so um to cut a long story short um we contended about scripture and um i walked away and you ask you then you told me you asked him if he thought the catholics were christians this uh, yes um, well, I, I ask, you know, quite a few different people, um, you know, especially if they, they come across as Christian, of whether they think um, high-profile characters are Christian, like, um, I can't think of his name now, um, Brown, Tony, uh, Tony Blair, sorry, Tony Blair, not Brown. Tony Blair was Christian, and, and most Christians I speak to say, yeah, he's, you know, he's Christian, he's, yeah, he, he goes to church, they're Catholics. The same as um, I think one of your presidents was as well, um, and, and John Kennedy was John a Kennedy. You know, so um, and and for me, you know, you, you you cannot be, you know, in the truth if you're, um, if you're in the rituals, if you're yeah. practicing the yeah, rituals, because that. it's 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 just you can't, you know. God has to open your eyes to it, and um, so. Yeah, um, he 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 wasn't impressed um, with. I mean, I'm I'm. I've not been to seminary. I'm not an expert in the Bible. I'm not either. You know, I'm just an everyday Joe that reads the Bible, <laughs> and God has God has dealt with me as I've I've walked the pilgrimage to, you know, bow to His will, and um, you know, and, until I came across you. Yeah. And that's when... It, how did, the, how did I, it affect I, you when you saw... When you saw me it affected me profoundly because when I listen to you, most of the preachers that I, I come into contact with didn't understand what was going on with me. So the sorrow, the suffering, the grief, they, you know, I mean, most of them were Pentecostal, so they they came across to say, "You haven't got enough faith, brother. You need to, you know, <laughs> build on your faith." And it's like, well, no, God gives you the faith. You know, 
he deals with you in a way for you to believe. And belief is the method of salvation. So, um, so yeah, it's it's been. I mean, it's been a wonderful journey, and you know, it's been painful. Yeah, you know, I, I've had to go through you know quite a lot of pain to to, to bow to God's will. You know, um, and and until going back to you know meeting well, your you, family doesn't believe the truth. No, they don't believe at all. Well, that's no. what it is with us too. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's astounding. I wish you know, God willing, that, you know, things would be different, but they're not. Well, and I can't I wish do no, I can't, not yeah. necessarily the will of God. No. No, I no, would it's like, the ordination I would like for my different. sister to believe the truth. My brother will never believe anything. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. The way life is. Yeah. It's... Well, we love you, brother. Yeah, I love you too. Really do. Nice to see you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you for a word. Thank you. That's all right. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> hey, you're welcome. Cheerio. 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 <laughs> I'm going to ask Diane Motram to come up here. She's she's uh, one of our school teachers. She was a school teacher down in Florida. She comes from England originally. Yeah. Not for That's where she was born, wasn't you? Born, yeah. British parents. British parents. Yeah. So I was taught to use a knife and a fork a certain way. Oh. Okay. And if you used it in another way, you were barbaric. You were heathen. Yeah, so that, that's the way I was brought up. I, I can't help it because I pronounce my T's. Oh, okay. So that's just the, I mean, I can't undo that. That's just the British in you. It's just the British in me. Well, it's part of life. I've got the Texan in me. I can't get rid of that. Y'all, that are the little short words. Yeehaw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there's so much I'd like to say to you, and there's so much I'd like you to understand of how grateful all of us are for what you teach. There's nobody like you. I don't feel like I know that much. You don't. You teach everything. From A to Z. Well, I go from one end of the Bible to the other, but if I sit down with y'all and told you what I don't understand, you wouldn't believe. Well, I'd nobody, like to hear that too. nobody knows all the Bible. The greatest DD, PhD in the world doesn't know all the Bible. Nobody. It's kind of like somebody saying, a guy knows all medicine because he's a doctor. No, he doesn't. They've got a field and they know their field, and that's basically it. I learned that a long time ago. Yeah, and they're so narrow-minded. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and one thing I do know for sure is everybody here, including myself, have gone through some really fiery trials. That's right. And people do go through trials in their life no matter what, but that's a right. true believer goes through those fiery trials and we're transformed. That's what God's doing with our lives. And we're getting more conformed to. But the you live, of the tell Lord. them where you live now. I live in, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, it's hot. You've been over here. And we have hurricane season for like June till November. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's not fun. And you were, tell them about what you've done, you've been teaching. I've been a t yeah, I was a, a public school teacher for 35 years, and you think that you're going to change, you know, make the world a better place. <laughs> and after a while, you're in the system for a good long while, and you realize the best you possibly can do is, you know, help a few people along the way, yeah. and that's about the best you're going to do. Yeah. You're not going to... Um, because well, the, the school is the system. system's corrupt. It's as corrupt as every other system. Yeah, sure it is. Our food is corrupt. The dirt is corrupt. Yeah. The atmosphere is corrupt. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The and sun, the moon, corrupt. the stars are corrupt. That's what the Bible yeah. says. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Anything else you want to say? To I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Dan calls and just to talk. Don't you? 
Yeah, I like to talk. I live by myself with three little dogs, and there's only so much you can say. Yeah. You know? We love you. I love them a lot, but, you know, they're not much on conversation. <laughs> Is there anybody else here that hasn't said something? Have you been up here, Leah. Eli? Eli? I, I've been up for the last time. Yeah, I think Lee and Diane summed it up for me. But maybe Rick Kraft was one of them. Up there, or John have, and have you have you been up here to give a yes. testimony? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Been, no, it wasn't quick. <laughs> Is anybody else here that hadn't been up here? Anybody else hadn't been up? Some video. Everybody's giving a testimony. What about Frank? Has Frank ever said something? Frank, have you ever given a testimony? You hadn't come up here. We like for people that haven't been up here. I want people to hear from your mouths what this has done for you. About a couple that Frank married church. What about what? If we did a joint testimony. Because we did separate ones when we came to church, but not since we got married. Well, that's up to y'all if y'all want to do another one. Yeah, John. I've been up there. I've been 17 years. You think I ain't been up there? We didn't ask all that. John's been up here. All the people. Go through the tapes. You'll find it. All the people have been up here. What number would that say? I don't know. <laughs> well, if there's nobody else, uh, what's your name? Uh, from Amarula. Robin. Huh? Robin. Robin Peters is going to be here Wednesday. And for a couple of days, we'll have her give a testimony. She's got a great testimony. She's got leukemia. And we're going to have her say a few words. It's, you don't have to be a public speaker. Just say your heart and what you're feeling about this message. Uh, I guess that would be enough on that. I've got a few emails I could read to you. These are people who write to us. Some of them like men. Some of them hate the ground I walk on, and I don't mind that. I like to be hated because that means I'm doing something right. I've got uh, some emails. I'll read these. Uh, Rick Hall. Speaking of Rick, have you said a word? No. Yeah, before. Before, okay. Rick Hall writes to us, Hi, Jim. Been listening for a long time. Love the truth of God's Word. I have a question regarding the cross in order to come close to 483 years or 69 weeks. Rick, you need Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ by Harold Honer. You've got to know that we have several different calendars. you got the Jewish calendar that's got it doesn't have 365 days in it. It's got about 355. And Mr. Honer will map that out for you. Just trying to add it up, you've got the Jewish calendar. You've got the Gregorian calendar. You've got the, the uh, Indian calendar. You've got several calendars that we go by. And we do not know what year we're living in actually. We don't know perfectly. And Mr. Horner tells you that. They had to add so many years after every break in years to make up for the years that are in the that are not in the Jewish calendar, that are in the Gregorian calendar. So I can't give you an answer to that real easy. I've taught on the 70 weeks of Daniel and going into Mr. Honer's figures. Harold Honer was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, a very bright, intelligent man. So if you want something on that, 
I don't know if I've even got one of those. I've I had some over here. I don't know what happened to them. Had a bunch of books over here. And uh, we'll be glad to send you one. Just email Tom and tell him you want one of Harold Horner's books. There's another book. It's called The 70 Weeks of Daniel by Alva McLean. They, they differ a little bit on time, but both of them are pretty much in line with the truth. And uh, his name is Alva McLean, 70 Weeks of Daniel. I've used both of them in teaching. We love you, Rick. Keep writing. Raj Ganaskara, no address. Dear Pastor Jim, I'm following and learning from your YouTube teaching, and I love your true teaching. Can you please let me know what is significant about barley in Passover? Barley was the poor man's food. That's the same thing we call oats. And the wheat was the rich man's food. When the Bible says in the uh, sixth chapter of Revelation, speaking of these four horsemen, that was the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. It says uh, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. That shows that there'll be a famine at the end of time because a measure would feed a man for one meal during the day. Three measures would feed him all day long. Barley was the poor man's food. Wheat was the rich man's food. Uh, wheat in Shabbat or Pentecost. Thank you. God bless. And Shalom Raj. Ganaskara. We love you, Raj. Keep writing. Jack, no address given. Dear Pastor Jim, thanks for your continued efforts to proclaim God's truth. I never get tired of hearing it. My question is, what does John 9, 4 mean? Work for the night is coming. Night depicts a time of sin. Uh, daylight, you're the children of the day, not the children of the night. That's talking about the difference between truth and a lie. Work for the night is coming for no man can work. They can't do the works of light when their sin is just running rampant. That goes back to the sun turned to darkness and the moon turned to blood. To turn to blood meant to die. The reason the moon would die is because it gets its light from the sun. You find that in the third chapter of Micah. The time would come when the moon would not give her light because when it speaks of the sun going down, it's talking about truth becoming less and less when darkness takes over. So when it's talking about the night uh, overcoming, being overcoming the light, it's talking about a light overcoming the truth at the, at the end of time. Thank you, Jack. And then Mike Correll in Paducah, Kentucky. Jim, I just have a quick question. How do you judge somebody without being judgmental? It's a good question. Everybody wants to go to Matthew 7 and 1. When they say, judge not. When you say that, you are judging. Judge is the word krino. This is the word judge in the Greek. Krino means when the Bible says in in Matthew 7 and 1. When, the, when a sentence starts with a verb, that's a verb, judge. When it starts with a verb, there's an understood subject. You judge not. You. Where'd you learn that? Oh, in the fifth or sixth grade, the teacher said, when a sentence starts with a verb, there's an understood subject. You judge not. Judge means to decide. Not just guilty, but also innocent. When somebody says, you're not supposed to judge. Yes, you are. John 7, 24. 
And you know what's amazing? Everybody knows where Matthew said. They don't know where it is. My mother-in-law used to say, the Bible says judge not. I said, no, it doesn't. And she was an old country woman. Yes, it does. I said, no, it doesn't. She said, yes, it does. I said, where? <laughs> and she'd say, I don't know, it's there somewhere. I said, you think maybe it's in Matthew 7 and 1? And I went to explaining this to her. John 7, 24 says, Look not at the outward appearance. Don't be prosopoleptal. Don't respect persons. Prosopoleptal. Pros. Apo. L-A-P-T-E-O. It comes from pros. Pros, which means toward. And ops. We get our word optical from that. Ops. It means pros, ops, and lambano. That's what the construction, this is respect of persons. That's the word in the New Testament, Greek there in James, the second chapter. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. It comes from pros, ops, and lambano. It means to motion toward what you see and take hold of that. It actually means it comes from the word prosopon. Prosopon means face or surface. That means when you look at some, if you're single and you look at some good looking girl, you say, I don't want to tell her the truth. I might get a date with her. And you better tell her the truth because if you get a date with her, she may be poisoned. <laughs> tell her the truth now. So when you judge righteous judgment, look not at the outward appearance but judge righteous judgment. Everybody quotes this, don't know where it is, but they don't even know this is there, do they? That says, do, what do you do when you judge righteous judgment? You tell people what God said. You tell, when you judge righteously, you tell them the truth. So that's righteous judgment, in case you couldn't figure that out. All right. So that's judging righteous judgment. When you say, don't judge, what you're doing, you're pronouncing someone innocent without the facts. It's just as wrong to judge unrighteously by saying, let him off the hook. Don't ever do that. But watch out that you're not putting your opinion in. Go by what the Bible says. Then I got an email from Anthony in New York. Hello, Jim. It's Anthony Vega again. I've been sharing videos of your teaching on my TikTok and on my Facebook page for evangelicalism for the glory of God. The video that I share is Message 1053, The American Lie, Democracy and the Pledge of Allegiance, etc. I believe in predestination. I believe in dying to self daily. Pretty much everything you preach. I believe that all things work for the good. I believe God has a plan and purpose because I am affiliated with a Baptist church. It's good because the Baptist in general needs correction. Oh, they needed a whole lot of correction. The Baptist back in 1850 all the presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention believed in predestination election. And they believed that Christmas was paganism. That's back 150 years ago. I respect you and your ministry in the Lord. Hope and pray God will use these videos that I'm sharing of you to bring him glory. Thanks again, Jim. Anthony in New York. We love you, Anthony. Keep writing to us. Now, I got some YouTube comments, and a lot of these people don't like me on YouTube. And some of them say ridiculous things without studying anything about the Bible. 
Donald Cagle uh, writes us on predestination. God is in charge of everything in the universe, all good and evil. That was the message. Was it God's will for Joseph Smith to get a vision to start the Mormon church? Yes, absolutely it was. There's nothing that happens in the world that wasn't the will of God. He wills evil, and then he wills to take vengeance on it. If the, if God is if there's going to be any evil, if God doesn't if God doesn't create it through Satan, his servant, there's not going to be any. If God wants to show wrath, God willing to show the wrath of man and make his power known, he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He wants that to happen. People say, you mean God wants evil to happen? Yes, and he wants to hold men accountable for it. Figure that out. I can't. But you say, that don't make any sense to me. You know why? Because you can't think like God thinks, and I can't either. He said, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. Your ways aren't my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. When you say that don't make any sense, just tell people that. Say, well, you can't think like God. That's why it don't make any sense. Then he says, to start the Mormon church, talking about Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith was an idiot. The Mormon church believes that Jesus and Satan were brothers and they lived on the planet Kolob. Sounds like Krypton and Superman, doesn't it? The guys that wrote Superman, they came out with the comic book the year I was born, 1939. And it sounds like Mormonism. Jesus and Satan were on the planet Kolob. Satan starts with a K, just like Krypton. And then they made a bid for the earth. Jesus got the bid somehow. I don't know if they drew lots or just crazy. And so when Jesus got the earth, all of Satan's followers were turned into black people. And being black, the Mormons would not let a black man or a black woman in the church in the early 1800s. That's crazy. If you're black and you're a Mormon, you're crazy. Get out of it. It's nuts. Anyway, when Jesus got the earth, he came down to earth, married Eve, and then he came back and married Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus, who is Jesus. It's the most convoluted, corrupt thing you could come up with. You can find this on the internet. It's called The God Makers. I used to have some films on it, and it's just insane. Those people are nuts. Besides that, they say they talk to God in a that the head of the Mormon church talks to Jesus out there in that secret chamber in the Mormon temple. And Jesus said, if anyone says, lo, here, or there, or he's in the secret chamber, believe it not. Don't believe the Mormons when they say that any more than you believe Oral Roberts when he says, I know if I saw I saw a 900 foot Jesus. How do you know it was 900 feet tall? Did he tell his son, Richard Roberts, here, get in this balloon and hold this tape measure? And Richard says, Dad, he's 900 feet tall. He's yelling down to oil on the ground. Was it the will of God that the drunk driver in Arkansas hit that cantaloupe truck? I told that story. I, me and I was in gospel music, and me and this acquaintance of mine drove up to this wreck, and there was there were six dead bodies out there on the highway. Excuse me, there were nine dead bodies out there, three in the pickup truck and six in this Cadillac. And me and Ronnie walked over there and looked inside the Cadillac, and they were just laying there dead. Six bodies in the car, and three in the pickup, and he was hauling cantaloupes. I couldn't eat cantaloupe for about five, six years after that, because here's these dead, burnt flesh, 
mingling with that smell of cantaloupes. I couldn't eat cantaloupe for a long time. Who holds the keys of death in hell? Jesus in the first chapter of Revelation. Was it the will of God? Death in hell is Jesus. He's the one that holds that. Besides that, he's declared the end from the beginning and from everything that's not done. Everybody that dies, everybody that's sick, everybody that has their house closed on, foreclosed on, everybody that gets a job, everybody that's fired from a job. Jesus does all of it. That's why we as believers in election and predestination, you can quit worrying about whether somebody's going to believe when you talk to them. Everybody you run into is one of two things. They're either a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, and that's most of the people in the world, or they're vessels of mercy, which God hath for prepared to glory. So you don't have to stress on whether they're going to believe or not. Don't argue with them about it. If they have an ear to hear, they may not believe the day you tell them, but if they are a vessel of mercy, they'll hear along the way somewhere. Our job is to tell the truth. It's not to convince anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Well, that makes witnessing a lot easier for me. I'll say anything to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Ask my doctors. Those guys are, most of them are really brilliant men. I've just pounded on them in their office. I hadn't beat them up. I just had uh, my allergist come up to me, sit down in front of me one day, and uh, Dr. Smith is his name. He sat down in front of me in a chair, and I'm up on that stool. He said, tell me about the West Cotton Hort and the Texas receptors. Tell me about that. And this doctor's telling me, tell him. So I go, Brrr, and I take off talking. He said, whoa, wait a minute. I can't understand that. I'm just a doctor. I started laughing. <laughs> I said, just a doctor. I never had a doctor say, I'm just a doctor. And I told his secretaries, and they thought it was funny. And he's a very intelligent man. If these six people in that Cadillac would have been home listening to good gospel music, there's no such thing as good gospel music. No such thing. The gospel songwriters don't know nothing about the Bible. If they did, they'd write songs about predestination. I've, I've written a song about it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he all called, them he also justified, whom he also justified, them he also glorified. Why don't somebody write that? They're not going to write a song like that, are they? They write stupid songs like, If working and praying has any reward, then surely some morning I'll meet my dear Lord. I'm really good enough to go to heaven. It's a stupid song. Or prayer is the key to heaven. Faith unlocks the glory. Prayer is not the key to heaven. It's stupid. That's the kind of songs they sing. So there's no such thing. Besides that, gospel singers are womanizers. They chase women. They drink. They cuss. You didn't know that, did you? But they do. I can tell you all about some of those guys. Corrupt to the core. They had mistresses all over the country. The most famous ones did. I knew them. I knew how they were. Uh, enough said about them. So, I don't believe there's any such thing as good gospel music. I believe there are good hymns. I love the the ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, and one little lamb was far away. The ninety and nine is a true song about sheep that go astray and the shepherd leaving the 99 going getting that sheep and he always gets them or the church's one foundation is a predestination song but those people don't sing those hymns 
I don't believe in gospel music. I was a gospel singer, and I know what they sing. I wouldn't even record the gospel songs that I did record. Not again. All right. Dan Craigle, I hope that'll help you. <laughs> I don't know if it did. All right. He said if there's home listening to good gospel music, they wouldn't have been in that car wreck. God wanted them in the car wreck and wanted to be killed. The devil's not getting by with anything. Even when all of Job's seven sons and three daughters were killed, Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Name is the word Shem. It means God's authority that killed my sons and daughters. And the last verse of that first chapter of Job says, And all this Job said not with his lips, nor charged God foolishly. He didn't accuse God of doing something he didn't do. God killed his kids. It was a great wind that came and blew the house down where they were partying. And when you read the 37th and 38th chapter of Job, God says, I'm in charge of the lightning. I'm in charge of the great winds, the small winds. Oh, it was the wind that blew it down. God did it. Those, what amazes me, the insurance companies know who did it. They say that it's acts of God. And go to the charismatic people, they say it's acts of the devil. Which one is right? I think it's the insurance company. They agree with the Bible. Isn't that funny? Lane Smith writes to us, Hello, Pastor Jim. Paul is strict in stating that women could not preach behind the pulpit. That's right. Today there are lots of female preachers. Joyce Myers is an idiot. She is a stupid moron. You'd think that she could read the Bible. And if a, if a man desired the office of a bishop, let her be the husband of one wife. No, no, him. Now, how can Joyce Myers be the husband of one wife? She's a, she's a moron. She don't, she's charismatic, believes in faith, healing, and tongues, and all the rest of it. And she doesn't know nothing about the Word of God. Enough said about that. There are lots of female preachers, especially in the Methodist denomination. There's a bunch of them in the Pentecostals. Would you clarify things further? I just did. Mary Beth Patrick writes to us on Revelation, Daniel, the false doctrine of dispensationalism. The church is spiritual Israel. They don't say end of the world in the Mount Olivet Discourse. They say end of the age. Uh, well, let me tell you something. I was going to say this during the message. There's two words for world in the Bible. I'm going to talk about this. Cosmos. And the other word is A-I-O-N-O-S. Oinos. Oinos is the word world. World without end. Forever. everlasting and a lot of people try to say well that just means the end of the age it's just they want to forget all these other words they say they cross them out get you a concordance and look these things up because it's not the way people say that's enough said on that I could sit for hours and go over it you should know this, Jim Brown. Oh, tell me, would you? Gosh, I never knew about Oinos, but you didn't even mention that yourself. And you didn't mention Cosmos, which means orderly arrangement. I'm going to talk to you about that before I start preaching. Johannes Olive, Olave Jarvinian commented on 
Revelation, Daniel, beast, ten horns, little horn, beast burned with fire, man of sin revealed. This knowledge sounds so right to my ears. Listening to other Bible teachers seems wrong to me. Good. I just want to listen to you, Jim. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Most preachers don't put any definition in their in their messages. Dusty Russell writes this on Baptism is our clothing. It is something God does to us, conforming us to His image. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for your teaching on predestination. It has really opened my biblical understanding. The more I've looked into it, I've found it perfectly ties the Bible together, precept upon precept. The more I have dug, I can even see in the angels you never see where they shed tears over man, and I have yet to find it. Angel. That's another misnomer in the Bible. Angel is simply the Greek word A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Angelos. That's two G's together. It's pronounced N-G. So it's actually angelos. And it's our word angel, and it means messenger. <laughs> You've got heavenly angels like Michael and Gabriel. And then you've got earthly angels like me, like you, if you go out and give somebody a message. You can say a little kid that goes next door to borrow a cup of sugar for his mother. He's an angel, not because he's cute. He's an angel because he's a messenger saying, my mama wants to borrow a cup of sugar. That's why he's an angel. I don't know why they just didn't put messenger everywhere they got angel. But they didn't. Probably Roman Catholics got a hold of that. Half the translators of the King James Bible were Roman Catholics. And the chief translator was a Roman Catholic priest. His name was Lancelot Andrews. You can find that in God's Secretaries. It's a book. It's got all the information in it. It was a knockdown drag out for about six years from 1605 to 1611 when they finished it up. whole bunch of error in it in the King James Bible, but not in the text of Sheceptus, the Greek text. Anyway, if you can explain it to me, that would be Great, thank you for your teaching, Pastor Jim. Thank you, Dust, to keep writing. V. Akmi writes us on seven trumpets, the last seventh trumpet, no pre-trib rapture. When will the seven years of tribulation start? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, do you? We know it's going to... It can't be far away. It has to do with prophecy. The 70th, the last seven years is the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks. And I don't have time to go into that. Sir, please explain Revelation 20. What? <laughs> the whole chapter? Revelation 20 starts off that Satan is bound so he cannot deceive the nations anymore for a thousand years. Now, it take me about an hour and a half just to explain what that means. Bound is the word dio. Forbid. It says he's bound a thousand years, but he can't be a thousand. If you reduce thousand to numbers, can't be that, because in the first century, there were no zeros in the Greek language. Any multiple of 10, 100, or 1,000 was a form of the original number. 1,000 is not an adjective like 999 is. It was a noun. 1,000 is singular. 2,000 would be plural. And it's not 1,000, it's kilia. Forget that thousand. It's talking about what we would call a thousand. But it's like 
dozen. One dozen is one dozen is twenty-four, but it's one. It's singular. Did I say tw- not twelve? Excuse me. One dozen is twelve. One pound is sixteen. Sixteen ounces. So, but you you can't call it sixteen different things. It's one pound. One dozen is twelve eggs. You you cannot. You cannot call, so when Satan is bound and kept from deceiving the nations, he's forbidden from, that's the same deal, the same deal as bind and loose. Same word as bind, means to forbid. That's a, that's a Jewish rabbi's term. And he's forbidden from deceiving the nations Nation is the word ethnos. And it means, doesn't just mean nations, it means Gentiles also. When you, when you define Gentile and nation, they're the same word, ethnos. We get our word ethnic from that. That's, he's, he can't deceive the nations for, Kili is plural, for at least 2,000 years. He, there's a section or a group of Gentiles that he cannot deceive for the last 2,000 years of time. I believe that's why we're real close to the end. I believe we're right on the verge of eternity. If a 1,000 years is one day and a day is a, Lord, is a 1,000 years, I believe we're right at the end of time. Could be... If Acts 2 was around 35 A.D., 2,000 years from there would be 2,035. I don't know if that'll be the time. It just looks real close to it. I'll be dead by then anyway. So it won't matter to me. The way the world's going, the way our politicians are going, and all the preachers are lying through their teeth, all of them, they're not going to tell you anything like this. Now he says, uh, where was I reading? I uh, can't remember where it was. Thank you, Pastor Jim, for your teaching on predestination. It's really opened my biblical understanding. The more I've learned, I find it perfectly ties with the Bible precept. No way I read that. Uh, when will the seven years of tribulation start? Your guess is as good as mine. It'll just have to be a guess. I don't set times in laws. I don't believe in setting times. But I do believe in looking at the Scripture and say, according to the Scripture, Israel will come back from the sword. They came back from the sword May 14th, 1948, and became a nation for the first time. The Bible says concerning this verse that the, that this generation will not pass away till all is fulfilled. It's the generation we are in, I believe that. I believe my grandsons who are 14 and 16 will very possibly see the end of time. I don't know how soon. Well, the way the government's going, something's going to happen. Enough said on that. Carlos Ark commented on Christmas is the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. He says, this guy has all his doctrine messed up. Thank you very much. You don't even know what doctrine is, do you? Didache, didascalia means instruction. You don't even know what he's talking about. He's an ignorant guy. Bob Corrigan commented. Bob, I've known Bob for 20, 25 years. Uh, He's down in Texas. I think Ennis, Texas, somewhere around there. He's got a brother, Richard Corrigan. And I've known Richard for about 30 years. Uh, Bob says, comments on God is in charge of everything in the universe, all good and evil. 
has ordered all things. Thank you, Jim. The first thing people need to understand about Scripture is the most important thing a sheep needs to sear into their brain is the sovereignty of God. Exactly, Bob. Everything about God, His love, mercy, wrath, forgiveness, salvation, prophecy, will, anger, purpose, plan, etc., flows out of God's sovereignty. That's right. Thank you, Bob. God operates out of His sovereignty. The wolves, the Pharisees, the goats try hard to diminish God's sovereignty by claiming that God is in control. This is like saying World War II was a minor skirmish. <laughs> to say that God is sovereign is to say that God rules over everything and that He is all-powerful and His will determines everything that happens. Past, present, future. God's sovereignty is made known throughout the Scripture. Thank you, Bob. I love you, brother. Thank you for saying the truth. That'll be enough reading, enough answering. And uh, I've got a few announcements. We're on TV, I don't know how many places. We've cut out some of our TV because we wasn't getting any response from a lot of the places. Our TV bill runs about 10000 a month, and we pay it every month. We got a full-time staff. We got five people on full time. Mike, Tom, Dave, my wife, Mary, and me. And uh, I don't get more money if you send your money. I don't take more money. I have a salary. I'm, I'm making enough to live on. My house is paid for. My cars are paid for. And I don't need any more. That's the way I look at it. When we have more come in, I give Tom, Dave, Mike, and Mary, I give them bonuses. And when we reach a certain level, I give them bonuses. They'll get one this month. And uh, we've got people all over the world writing to us. I've got a list of people that I send to regularly. These people right here on this list. I'll go to the bank either tomorrow or Tuesday and get all these people get them a cashier's check. It'll be anywhere from 550 to $300, depending on how serious sick they are. People that's got leukemia or cancer, I give them up to $300. People that have just having a hard time living, we may give 100 or $50 to these people. Uh, we, I just want to help these people. They're people that are poor, and they cannot help themselves. I have to know that they, they have to believe the truth. They have to communicate with me and say something about the truth that they're hearing. Otherwise, I'll drop them from the list. You have to contact us and let us know. Uh, we're sending money to Lord Nadab, Elizabeth Taylor. She's a black lady in Dayton, Ohio. Sherry Johnson out in Arizona. Connie Bonner in Lebanon, Tennessee, Amanda Meadows in Murfreesboro, Danielle Thigpen in southern Louisiana, Robin Peters, Patty Knight, they're around the world, Elijah, Elijah Pratt, uh, Robert Whistler, uh, Rebecca Rogers, Sharon Marshall, Rose Jackson, and Kim Pearson. And I've got several other people here that I've had on the list. And if you want to help these people, some of them are just like they're treading water, trying to stay alive. They don't, if the least thing happens, Rebecca, that you went out there and saw to it that she had a water heater, she called me and she said something about the water heater was on propane or something. And when you hooked it up, it's not working now. I told her, have a repairman come out and find out what it'll cost, and we'll send her the money to have it repaired. And uh, we got people like that all the time. And people just, but they believe the truth. Rebecca really believes these truths. We love you, Rebecca. Then we got Danielle Thigpen. 
she's down there in southern Louisiana, and she's a paraplegic. She became one when she ran into a, she was driving to her mother's house about 16 years ago, fell asleep and ran into a telephone pole and became paraplegic. We've got the money to buy her a wheelchair accessible van, and we're going to get her one as soon as she gets through this government program. And it will cost fifty or sixty thousand. I don't know exactly how much, but anyway, if you want to help her and help this ministry without offerings, I don't normally give any kind of appeal for offerings. I don't pass an offering plate. We got boxes at each door to give offerings. That's if you want to. I never, I don't ever ask for money for this ministry. I ask for money for the poor and the needy because the Bible says my, that's my duty is to do that. And uh, I do that. We are on TV around the country. We are we're on the radio in New Orleans every Saturday morning. We're on the radio in Nashville, WNQM. That's 1300 on the AM dial. And that's every Saturday morning about eight or nine o'clock, just turn on 13 on the uh, AM dial. Then we're on WNAH. That's 1360 on the AM dial, Nashville. It's just a low voltage station. And we're on there. I can't even keep up with the times. Every morning at 7, 8, 9, 30, 12 or something, 1230, and every afternoon, just turn it on to 1360. During the day, you'll hear me sometime there. We're on every afternoon at uh, at 2, 2.30, no, one thirty. every afternoon. Turn on 1360 on the AM dial, and you'll hear us. You'll hear me teaching. Sometimes I'll hear and I'll say, man, that's a really good message. I need to get Mike to get me one of those, but I don't know which one it is. I don't know what the number is. And uh, But anyway, you can turn on WNAH any day of the week in the morning and hear us. And then we're on Saturday uh, through the day. We're on Sunday afternoon about 2 o'clock. I'll have to get the times on that, but... You can talk to the NAH, you'll catch me all through the day. Well, that'll be enough announcements. I need to get on teaching. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth. God, we pray that you'll fight our battles. Lord, I don't want to fight anybody anymore, ever. Just give us strength to continue. Defend us. And God will give you praise for everything. In Christ's name we pray, amen. some of this.
I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I've given everybody two papers. Zach, did you get these? Okay. Everybody needs these. I'm going to try to show you how to study the Strong's Concordance, how you match everything up, and how that blends with the word study concordance. The Strong's Concordance has every word in the Bible listed in it alphabetically. And what you do, you look up a word and you look to the right of the word and there'll be a number. If it's an Old Testament word, it will be in the, Greek, the Hebrew dictionary in the back. If it's a New Testament word, it'll be in the Greek dictionary in the back. The New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Now, I'm going to use something to show you how you need to look at things in your, in your uh, Greek in the Strong's Concordance. I've given you this paper. It's got a K on the top left-hand corner. K. That's because I'm going to talk about cosmos. I usually say cosmos. I don't care how you pronounce it as long as you get what it means. Cosmos. K-O-S-M-O-S. That's the word world in John 3.16. John 3.16. I'll just put J-O-N. That's the word world. The, the O, the Omicron, is pronounced ah. The omega is always pronounced O. Now, I don't care how you want to pronounce it. If, you, if it's convenient to, do, to you to say cosmos, that's fine with me. That's not going to change the definition. Now, cosmos is the word world for God's soul of the world in John 3.16. But I want you to notice something. When you look up a word in the... In the uh, Strong's Concordance. Notice I've got I've got highlighted in yellow on your paper. This is all the words that comes from cosmos. Look at the word. Look here at twenty eight eighty nine. That is I've got that memorized. I know twenty eight eighty nine is cosmos. I know that, and it says orderly arrangement. And it says, from the base of 2805. So, cosmos is 2889. 2889. And it comes from the base of 2865. And notice 2865 is over here on the far left column. 2865 is the word... Comedzo. K 
O-M-I-C-O. And notice, everything about cosmos has to do with decorating, adorning. In other words, being uh, adorning and, and having an orderly arrangement. We get the word, when you look at, at uh, 2865, Comezzo comes from cameo, and we we get the word cameo from that. A cameo decorates a woman when she wears it around her neck. It's a decoration. So when you're thinking of decoration or adorning, you're still in the subject of cosmos. Cosmos, remember I told you that uh, a man named Zeno, came up with this idea of cosmos. Zeno, he started something called Stoicism, S-T-O-I-C-I-S-M. Stoicism. The Stoics were these brilliant uh, philosophers. The two most popular philosophies in the first century were Stoicism and Epicureans. Epicureans. Now you and I think of we think of Epicureans, what do we think of? We think of a connoisseur of good foods and good wines. That's what we think of. Well, the Epicureans said all that a man needed was to fulfill his belly. Paul used the word belly several times. He said, men hate the cross of Christ because their God is their belly. Belly did not mean stomach. The belly was the place, place of all sensual desires, whether it was sexual, whether it was food, whether it was what you could see, whether it was lust, whatever it was. The Epicureans said that fulfilled the belly. And Paul said, uh, Mark them which cause offenses, divisions and offenses that are contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned, because they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. He was talking about sensuality, everything that fed their wants. So that was Epicureans. The Stoics were considered to be more brilliant people. They didn't look at the physical like the Epicureans. They would look at brilliance and intelligence. Mr. Mr. Zeno, when he started Stoicism, he came up with the idea of cosmos. He said all of our universe was a cosmos. He called it that, and he said it was a living, breathing entity. And being a living, breathing entity, he said, it's like I'm a living, breathing entity. I'm, I'm living, breathing because I've got all these blood vessels, I've got a pulmonary system, I've got a cardiac system, and this is the entity that I am. Well, he said the stars, Jupiter and Mercury and, and, and all these planets, plus all the stars out there, that this was a great, brilliant uh, cosmos. It was a living entity. And he said what gave it life was Numa. You can get this out of P-N-E-U-M-A. Numa and Per. Numa is the word spirit. Per is the word fire. John the Baptist says, I baptize with water that comes one after me. He'll baptize you with holy Numa and Per. Mr. Zeno said Numa and Per was what gave this great sphere that we live in all the stars and all being a it would be like your be like your fingernail would have a bunch of atoms in it and these atoms in this one little maybe just one little atom the nucleus and the electrons and the protons would be our be like our solar system would have mercury and, and jupiter and all these planets and that would be a living, breathing entity. Where did you get this, Jim? I've got all kinds of books on Stoics and Epicureans. I've got one called Harvest of Hellenism. Hellenism. 
Hellas was a term for Greece, but it wasn't a term for the land of Greece. Hellas. Hellas was a term for cultural Greece, for the languages, their culture, their customs, their idioms, their metaphors. And Paul is always running into either Epicureans or Stoics. You can find him running into some Epicureans and Stoics in the sixth, in the seventeenth chapter of Acts. He runs into these guys, and they say, "This man is speaking to us of strange gods." Except they didn't use the word gods; they used the word. Daemonion. What do they mean, strange gods? Because they called all of their gods demons, which is we get from Daemonion. So they called all their gods that. So we know that they called their gods by the title of demons. And if you don't look that up in a concordance, you'll never know that, that they called them demons. That's what the pagans called. They said demons were their ancestors. They would come back as men gods. They walked around on the earth. And that's what they called Jupiter. You can see some of these men gods on a Saturday afternoon old movie out of the 50s when they're talking and their mouth is not matching their actions. I bet you Let's go down to that river and see that other god down there. You ever seen one of those? Well, they call those guys their gods or their demons. Anyway, so, Mr. When John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but there comes one after me, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. What he was saying, he will baptize you with life because that's what they said. And that saying had been around for 300 years because Mr. Zeno lived back around 320 B.C. So that was such a common saying. Everybody knew it. Everybody that heard John the Baptist preaching that day knew that he was saying life when he said holy pneuma and purr. But you're not going to know that unless you read something about Stoics and Epicureans. You've got to know. If you see a book, when I found this harvest of Hellenism, I always want books that everybody else don't want. They had already in this used bookstore down at Rivergate Shopping Center, uh, I was walking up to the used bookstore and I saw uh, books on sale out front and they were like two and three dollars a piece. And I looked through and I found this Harvest of Hell and I said, that's the kind of book I want. I grabbed it up. A fantastic book about the culture of the ancient world. Anyway, if you look at your paper, you'll find that Comae in 20, 2865 is Comezzo and it means to provide for, to carry off. It means to provide for, in a sense, to decorate or something like that. Because if you'll notice, it comes from Comae 2864 and 2864 from the same as 2865, the hair of the head as ornamental. Now, what I did for you. I've put the last page of that paper. I've got these words made up. This is out of Word Study Concordance. I pulled it out of there. What you do is you look up the word in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Then you go to the Word Study Concordance. It'll tell you every time these words are mentioned. So it will tell you here that 2863, which is the word komeo, that in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, if a man have long hair, that's not actually what it says. It says if he have komeo hair, or he has hair in stresses, what do you mean hair and stresses? The hair and stresses was how the women cut their hair so that they could tie their 
dowry in their hair. Their dowry was the only thing they could take with them if their husband walked in and said, I divorce you, get out. The woman owned nothing in the first century. She was not a property owner. All the property, the land, the houses, everything, the cattle, belonged to the man. That's why Jesus got fed up with it. He said, I don't like this. Women being completely left out. The Pharisees said they could walk into their house and say, found a better looking woman than you. I divorce you. Get out. And all she could do was carry what was on her person. That's it. So they would tie their dowry in their hair. So they'd have coins and silver and uh, maybe jewelry. And that's all they could carry. If they lived. When they were cast out in the street, Israel was a very poor, poor nation. Most of the nations in the first century were poverty stricken. And they didn't have any money. So the women would end up going into the street and becoming prostitutes because it's the only way they had of making any living. And Jesus said, I'm tired of that. He says, I want you to give a woman a bill of divorce. That means an equal division of the property. Split everything with her. Well, the Pharisees didn't like that because that's why they went up to Jesus and said to him in Matthew 19, can a man divorce his wife for every cause? Because that's what they did. If she burned the bread, they'd say, I divorce you, get out. That's why I, on your paper I wrote, it's barely legible, Luke, 16, Luke 15, 8 and 9. Look at Luke 15, 8 and 9. Every commentary I've ever read on Luke 15, 8 and 9 says, when this woman lost these pieces of silver, in all probability, the reason she went desperate was because this was part of her survival, her dowry. Look at... But you're not going to know that without studying the culture of the first century. Look here in... Luke 15. Let me go over there. We'll read that. And all my commentaries that I've read on it says this was in all probability her dowry. If her husband came in and said, I don't want you to get out. All she could take was on her body. That's it. She had no rights. Jesus said, I'm sick of that. That was the law of the Pharisees. Those guys were very corrupt. Luke 15. Let's read this. Luke 15, 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she have one, have one, lost one piece, doth not light a candle. Now, candle is not the word. It's the word taper. Wax candles weren't invented until somewhere in the last 300 years. It's not a candle. It was a little bowl that had oil in it, and they had a little taper on it. That was a candle. They put candle because this was translated in 1605 to 1611 when they ran around the streets with candles. So he says that uh, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently. She's lost part of her dowry till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. It's part of my way of living in case my Pharisee husband comes in and says, I divorce you, get out. She took nothing with her. <laughs> and it's something what they think. Now, go back to this paper here. Look at Comeo, which is a form of cosmos, orderly arrangement. Look here at uh, 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Let's read 
1 Corinthians 11, 14, 15. Let's read that. 1 Corinthians. I don't, it's going to take me a long time to get through this. I don't even know if I'll be able to address the title today. There's a, I'll give you a, a piece of it. I'll give you a piece of it so you can chew on that. Okay? Now, here in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians eleven, fourteen, and fifteen. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's not long hair. Long would be an adjective in English. What kind of hair? Which what kind of how many? It tells what kind of hair. It's not it's not that, that he have longed hair. It's actually an adverb in the Greek. So they've changed it from, uh, they've changed it into an adjective. It's not. So longed hair means he's got his hair cut in tresses. So he can tie a dowry in it. He doesn't need a dowry. He's not in danger of losing his inheritance. And then it turns around and says, but if a woman have tresses in her hair, it is given her for a covering. Covering doesn't mean just something to cover her up. It means something to cover her Poverty, if he comes in and says, I divorce you, get out. You're not going to know this unless you study the laws of the Pharisees. And then I want us to look over here. I can't spend a lot of time on this. And look at 1 Corinthians 11. Well, 11, 15, the word is comag. We, In all probability, we'd get our word comb from that. We comb our hair. And then you look at if you notice, all these words come from each other. It says so on that front page there. It says, Come comes from 2865. And that's the word comizo or comeo to take care of properly to provide for. But it has to do with comeo to wear the hair wear tresses of the hair so they could tie dowry in it. It takes some more than to study in the concordance than just reading words. You've got to match these things up together. Now, let me give you back up to cosmos. Cosmos. If you'll notice in 2889 is cosmos. That's what you'll find in your concordance. 2889. And it says, probably from the base of 2865, which is comezo, which comes from come, which comes from, which comes from comeo or cameo. And they all, they all have to do with an orderly arrangement of the hair. This transcends all parts of the body and all parts of the universe. They connected all of their doctrines together to make, make it easier to understand. Now look back over here. Notice this. Comas, 2889. And it will tell you, if you look up above this, it will say, Cosmo Crater right above it, that's 2888, and it comes from 2889, which is cosmos, and Carturo, which means ruler. It means a world ruler is a cosmo creator. Then it, it, and of course, that comes from the word cosmos. Then look above, always look at the words around. These are what you would call morphemes. 
morphemes is word shapes. It's word shapes. The word morpheme means to shape. You remember, we're predestined to be conformed. Conformed to his image, to his likeness. To be conformed is sum morphos, M-O-R-P-H-O-S. It comes from morphe, which means to be shaped. Sum means in fellowship with. So all these words, they blend together along the way. Then you look at Cosmios, 2887, right above Cosmocrator. 2887, Cosmios means orderly or decorous. When you back up on the last page, look at 2887 on the last page. 28. It, it's the next page, 2887. Well, 2887 and 2886, Cosmicos and 2885. When you look up cosmetic in, the, in a dictionary, Webster Dictionary, it will say it comes from the Greek, Cosmicos. And then you get the same thing, Cosmeo, in 2885. you got to work all these together. What they are, they're morphemes and they come from one another. K-O-S-M. That's the stem of the word. Stem has the meaning. Word endings are shaped depending on what, whether it's a noun or a pronoun or whether it's plural or whether it's masculine, feminine, neuter, gender. It all depends on what the word ending is. So you've got all of these things. And turn over here to that second page. And all of them have to do with decorations, with being decorative. And when it speaks here in, in Titus 2.12, in 2886 here at the top that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world that's the way the rest of the verse reads and worldly lust that's the way a person decorates themselves with cars and houses and things and diamonds and fancy clothes and then it's talking about Worldly sanctuary in Hebrews 9 and 1. Then you get down here to cosmios. We get the word cosmetic from that. When a woman paints her face, she's decorating her face, isn't she? And she puts an orderly arrangement on her face. Look there at 2887. That women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. Modest is a form of cosmos, which is the word world in John 3.16. It's a form of it. So you have to learn to look at these, these word shapes and how they're connected to other words. When it says, and all of these are told to go back to 2889. It's from 2889, which is the word cosmos, meaning an orderly arrangement. That's the word world in John 3.16. And it is masculine gender, masculine gender. And it's talking about an orderly arrangement, either of a woman's face or of this great universe we live in. That's how sometimes it can look complicated, but always look at the ver words before and after a word that you're looking up in your concordance. You understand what I'm saying? When you look at the word, have any of you done learned to do that? Look at the words before and after and see if they, do they have the same stem? Do they have a, have a kinship definition? 
to adorn a woman to adorn herself in modest apparel is kin to the word world in John 3.16 because both of them's an orderly arrangement. That's an orderly arrangement on a woman's face, and that's an orderly arrangement of mankind. John 3.16. You gotta learn to look at these words this way. And then cosmos, I didn't even I didn't print all the words for cosmos out. That's 2889. I only printed down to here. If you notice that number right there by 2889, that's how many times the word cosmos is mentioned in the New Testament. Each time when you see 2888, the word cosmocrator is mentioned one time. Cosmeo, cosmos, 2087 is mentioned two times. And cosmicos, 2086 is mentioned two times. And cosmeo, it sounds like cosmetic. And if you look up the word cosmetic in your Webster Dictionary, especially in the Intercollegiate Dictionary, they will tell you the origins of the words, and most of them go back to the Greek. If you get, if you get this kind of a dictionary, be sure you get an Intercollegiate Dictionary because it will tell you what word they come from in the ancient world. It will say uh, ancient Greek, Middle English, French. It'll tell you what it comes from. So everybody needs an intercollegiate dictionary. If you don't get one that just has the definitions, get one that has an origin of the words. And you can match them up with the Strong's. Now, hold on a second. I don't have time to go to all the detail that I would like to go to with you. But look here at Cosmeo. And it talks about in Luke 21, at the bottom of the page of 429, at Luke 21 and 5, Look, look at Luke 21, 5. Turn over there. I just want you to be able to learn to use your concordance to the fullest extent. Look at all the words before word and after word and see if the words are connected together by the stem of the word. Now look here in Luke 21, and five. And if you'll notice, Cosmeo, it says right up, see, here's, it's 2885. When you look over here to the right at the top number, it says 2889. That's the word cosmos. It, what it's saying is this word Cosmeo comes from cosmos. The word, same word as world. That's an orderly arrangement. This is an orderly arrangement. Every time you find adorned in the New Testament, it's a form of cosmos. I'm just simply trying to help you learn how to study your, your concordance with the word study concordance. This thing is invaluable. Because every time I write these, put these things down, I make copies out of my word study concordance and out of my concordance. Now, look here at Luke 21. We know it comes from 2889 because it says so right here. And look here in Luke 21 and 5. If you'll notice in 1 Timothy 2 and 9, Titus 2.10 are the words adorn. Uh, to adorn oneself means to decorate oneself. It's the same thing as cosmos. It means to decorate. It's a decorated. It's God's great decoration. They're all related to one another in definition. And they all have basically the same definition in the Greek other than the fact decorating a face is what a woman does Decorating the universe is what God does. 
you got to come to that realization. That's the way you look at these words. And look here in Luke 21 and 5. All I'm trying to do is help you to learn how to study your concordance and the word study concordance with it. Does this help at all? You need to know how to put the two together. Because, and you need, don't just look up a word in a concordance. Look at the words before and after and see if they have the basic same structure. Especially if they got the stem of the word, that's the same thing. Cause, 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 cause. Cosmos, cosmios. Cosmos, cosmicos. They all have cause in them. That's the stem. That's what the word is built on. Now look here in Luke. I can't read all of them. But Luke 21 and 5. Sometimes I think it's just better to set everybody down. Say, let me show you a few things about this. I've spent the last 42, 43 years studying the concordance and looking at these different words and how they tied together. The Greek is not as hard as you think because a lot of the words, a lot, they've got a lot of the prefixes, uh, epi, en, ap, apo, and you have it on many different words. You just find out that apo means off of, in means within, epi means to cover with. They all have, you may have epi corregio or epi whatever, and epi means on top of or to cover with. And look here at Luke 21 and 5. 21 and 5. And it's talking about a dawn. And it came to, and as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned or decorated with goodly stones and gifts, he said. So it can be righteous or doesn't necessarily have to be righteous it doesn't have to be unrighteous there's nothing unrighteous about the temple being decorated or adorned adorn and cosmos are basically the same word can you see that somebody comment to me I just want you to see how these things come together now I've got a title on the board. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through this. I'm going to set this aside. I'm going to look at your other paper. The other paper is about Mark. I've got up here a blood baptism in the name. Let me say something that I've been thinking about this all night long. I couldn't even sleep because of it. I thought, how am I going to explain that and are the people going to see it? Now look here at, let me get my paper out. I got the M on it because it's about Mark. And these words are forms of the same word. Uh, I've got a paper I didn't give to you. It's got every time the word Mark is listed in the Bible, that comes out of my concordance. Then you've got Mark. The Mark of the Beast. This is... show you something that's very interesting. Mark of the Beast has been something that's real puzzling. And you can see it when you work on your concordance. There's a verse in the Bible that unravels the Mark of the Beast. It's in the 13th chapter of Revelation. Let's go over there to the 13th chapter. When you look at, look at this, look at this front page. 
Mark is the word karagma, but it tells you it comes from 5482, which is the word karax. Notice this. They have the same stem. C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. And it tells you in your concordance, it's a form of karax. Notice they have the same stem. That's why they're related to one another. And then they've got, and then it says in verse, karagma means a sketch or an etching, a stamp, a badge of servitude. That means whoever you're serving, that's the mark you have. And then it'll tell you that it comes from this 4982 Karax, and they have the same stem, C-H-A-R-A. Then you've got in verse, in 5481, Karakter comes from 5482. Karagma, Karakter comes from Karax. They have the same stem. They are related. And then it'll tell you. Let's just read these. Karagma. A scratch or an etching. You have to understand something. Very few people owned books in the ancient world. They were very hard to come by. And very few people owned them. And the ones that very few people could read them. They weren't books like we think of. A book, I pick up a book and show it to you. It was scrolls. Very people knew how to read anything back then. Israel was a poverty stricken nation. They had very few people could read anything, but they would scratch on things, scratch pictures, an etching. That's the way they communicated. It's just like some guy in the South, and they say, Sign, put your X on this, and he can't write, so he just goes, puts an X there. It's the same thing they did. And then it says in 5481, Karakter comes from 4982, which is Karax. It means a graver, the tool or the person, and engraving are a character. When you look at the word character in a dictionary, character is the method of a man's life and the way he lives. Mark of the beast is going to be the character of Satan. It has not changed from the beginning to the end. Hasn't changed. Satan is always at war with God. He's an adversary to God. In fact, Satan in the Greek, in the Hebrew, is Satan. And Satan in the Hebrew is Satanos. And they have basically the same meaning. They mean adversary. When you look at the word adversary, the majority of the time, it's either, it will be Satan. It's pronounced S-A-W-T-A-W-N. That's the way it sounds, Satan. And it means an adversary. Look up adversary in your concordance, and it'll come up most of the time with Satan. So Satan is an adversary of God. The mark of the beast has to be an adversary of God. Satan's nature does not ever change. If it changes, he's going to get off the track and possibly become do a righteous thing, and he's never going to do anything righteous. His where do you find the nature of Satan in Genesis? 
He adapts his nature. What is the first thing that Satan does? That's evil. First thing. He corrupts the earth, doesn't he? In the beginning, God created. I'll have to bring this in here. Let me erase this. In the beginning, God created. Created is a righteous word. Bara. He created heaven and earth. The Bible says this is what God did in Genesis 1 and verse 1. Created heaven and earth. In Isaiah 45, 18, God says, When I created the earth, I created it to be inhabited. I did not create it in vain. In the second verse of Genesis, And the earth became without form. And void in darkness. Without form and void in darkness is the nature of Satan. It is his characteristic. The mark of the beast has to be his character. What is Satan's character? He creates corruption. Without form is the word tohu. It means worthless. Remember, bara is righteous. We get the word barith from that, which is the word covenant in the Hebrew. In vain, in Isaiah 45, 18, God said, I created nothing in vain. That is also the word tohu. He said, what's going on here? Tohu, without form, is not what I created in the first verse. That's what he says. And I keep saying, Satan was cast into the earth by Michael the archangel in Revelation 12. And wherever Satan, the way you find out where Satan came into the earth, look for the first nature of Satan in the Bible. Where do you find it? The second verse of Genesis. Second verse. Some There was some time between the first and second verse. Could have been millions of years. In fact, it, it surely was because when you go outside and you look at the stars in a real wide open night and it's bright, you look up at the stars, the stars are actually suns, just like our sun. The nearest star to us is Alpha Centaurus. And it takes, light travels at 186,000 miles every second. So the fact that there was darkness upon the face of the deep, the word face, panim, P-A-N-I-Y-M, that's as though the Bible's telling us there should be light inside the earth. But evidently there's some kind of crust or film around it stopping the light from coming in. When God says, let there be light, that's not when he created light. He created light in the first verse. When he said, let there be light, that's like a circumcision. He's saying, get out of the way, film. Circumcise the earth and let the light in. I believe Genesis, the first chapter, is a picture of the elect. Six is the number of man. Six days he works and seventh he rests. All through the Bible, six is the number of man. So, when if the light travels 186,000 miles per second, and it takes four and a half years for light to get here from Alpha Centaurus, four and a half years traveling this fast, how long do you think it takes to get from some of those stars that you look at on a clear night? Some of those stars have been burned out, who knows, a, a thousand years, a million years, and we're seeing the light coming this direction. 
You can't just come up and say, like Jerry Falwell, the earth is 6,000 years old. What an idiot he was. He actually said that. Of course, my father said that too. It's, it's 6,000 years from Adam. Adam wasn't created in the beginning. The beginning was chapter 1, verse 1. There's perhaps millions of years between 1 and 2. So the nature of Satan is to corrupt and make without form and void and darkness, isn't it? That's the nature of Satan. That's easy to figure out. And the light has to be moving fast to get here. So it's bouncing off of the earth. It would be foolish to say darkness is upon the surface of the deep if there was no light coming. The whole idea of darkness upon the surface of the deep is that light is hitting the hitting that. When God says, let the light in, he's circumcising the earth, isn't he? Exactly. That's a picture of man right there. The first chapter of Genesis, a picture of the sovereignty of God. Now, where do I go from here? I'm talking about the nature of Satan. Let me give you something before I forget. We're talking about the mark of the beast, the choragma of the beast. Let me show you something that's real easy to figure out what it is. Go to Revelation, the 13th chapter. Revelation 13. It's going to take a lot of studying to get through this. There's two marks. There's the mark of God and the mark of the beast. What is the beast? What's the beast? Somebody tell me. It's Babylon. Persia. Greece and Rome. What is the mark? If there was a beast back here, what is the mark or the character of the beast? It is, it's the same thing as the serpent in the garden. When we look at the serpent, look at Genesis, the third chapter. The mark of the beast is everything the serpent was and did. He wasn't a poison serpent. Look at Genesis 3 and 1. Trying to get through all this is going to be something else. Okay, Genesis 3. And one. The beast is in the garden. What is the beast? What did they do? What did Babylon do? Ruled the world. What did Persia do? Rule the world. What did Greece do? Overthrew Persia. Rule the world. What did Rome do? Rule the world. What does the serpent do? Who was ruling in the garden? The serpent is getting his way. And the Bible said, and how was he getting his way? I believe the mark of the beast is wrapped up in the definition of the serpent. The serpent was more subtle than any beast. The beast was there. Any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. What does the serpent do? He simply twists the Word of God 
and says with smooth words. Serpent is the word nakash. And nakash means to whisper. To speak smooth words. It means to enchant. Enchant doesn't mean to do an enchantment like some soothsayer. It means to make you feel good. That's what the mark is about. The mark is his character. His character's always been good words and fair speeches, haven't they? That's been his nature always. That is his name. The name is the mark. I'll show you that. It means to enchant. When you get to the dragon, people think of a fire-breathing dragon. That's not the meaning of the word in Revelation 13. It's the word dracon. It has basically the same meaning as serpent. It means to fascinate. See, you cannot get people to follow you if you say wicked words breathing fire and brimstone, you got to talk smooth. Paul said to mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrines you've learned, and avoid them because these that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the simple. It's good words and fair speeches that comes out of the serpent's mouth. It's not, <laughs> don't look at that, don't look for that. It's a smooth-talking Baptist preacher. You know what it is? It's another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, one that talks smooth, and he doesn't ever make you feel bad. He doesn't cackle. And look down here. Look here in... Genesis 3. Adam and Eve eat of the tree. They have sinned. Sin is the transgression of the law. The word transgression is the same word. It's anomia. It's the same word as iniquity. Anomia comes from nomos. That's the word law in the Greek. And the alpha primitive negates the word. It means no law of God in your life. That's the word iniquity. That's what they did when they came to the tree in the midst of the garden. They partook of Satan's nature. Let me read a verse to you. Let me read this right here right now. The first baptism took place in the garden. Adam and Eve took fig leaves off of a fig tree and tried to cover up their nakedness. And God says, that's the works of your hands. That won't do. So God killed an animal. How do you know he killed him? Well, he says he clothed their nakedness in verse 21 of chapter 3. Unto Adam also and his wife God did the Lord God make coats of skins. He had to get them from an animal somewhere. God killed an animal in the garden to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness with a blood baptism, a blood sacrifice. That's what it took. Now, I want you to look over here in Revelation 13. We're going to look at the... We're going to look at what... There's a word that identifies with Mark. Mark is the word choragma. It means the character of the beast... I've already been telling you the character of the beast was good words and fair speeches. That's his character. He's not going to deceive by cackling like some witch, by wearing red suit horns and a tail. He's going to deceive by wearing 
a nice three-piece suit with a watch fob with his hair all coiffed and looking pretty. He's going to deceive by looking like a Baptist preacher or a Pentecostal preacher. I want you to look and I want you to listen real, real slowly to this. Numbers, I mean, Revelation. People have wondered, what is the mark of the beast? It tells you exactly what it is. Mm. I had a pain there. It tells you exactly what it is here in the 13th chapter of Revelation. Let's back up here to in uh, verse 15. He had power t to give life unto the image of the beast. It doesn't mean the only one that can give life. It's not a statue. It's an image, an icon of the beast. It's what's representing the beast upon the earth. There's two beasts here. There's a beast in the first part of this chapter. The beast I saw was like a leopard. And it doesn't say his feet. It says its feet. You've heard me say that. Uh, it's a wrong translation of King James Bible. Its feet was, I saw it was like a leopard. And its feet was the feet of a bear. And his mouth was the mouth of a lion. The lion, the bear, and the leopard is the exact same beast as in Daniel 7. That the lion is Babylon. The bear is Persia. The leopard is Greece. And then the fourth beast was Rome. The beast with iron teeth. Now let's keep reading. I'm not going to get into head being wounded to death. That's, that's the outlawing of one of the capital cities. Let's go down here. Let's go down here to verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast would be killed. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to worship the karagma, the characteristic of the beast, the good words and the spare speeches, the smooth talk. That's easy to deceive with smooth talk. And that no man could buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name or is a conjunction saying Here's two ways to describe the mark. You can either call it the coragma or the name. Or as a conjunction that shows relationship between mark and name. So you can substitute name for mark every time you see it. Name, the beast is who? Babylon? Right? Where did Babylon get her name? Does anybody recall that? Genesis 11 and verse 4. The word name is the word onoma. Onoma means authority. Where did Babylon get her authority? She said, let us build us a city and a tower and let us make us a name. That word is Shem in the, Greek, in the Hebrew. It's the same word when they translated Hebrew over to English or to Greek, they translated Shem to Onoma in the Septuagint. So Shem is the same word as Onoma. It means God's authority. So everywhere you find the mark, things that are equal to the same thing, mark and name are equal to the same thing. That is the authority of the beast. 
Name means authority or his character. Kharagma means authority or his character. It's the same thing. So wherever you find the mark of the beast, you can substitute his character. That's the character of the beast is good words, fair speeches, deceiving the world. How in the world does that mean that those that don't receive the mark don't receive his authority? Let me say this to you. They're, getting, they're coming down hard on Christians. There's two men in Israel. I got an email from someone, I forget who it was. There's two Israelites that's trying to stop the preaching of Jesus in Israel. You know what? I think they should too. You know why? Because all they know is Kenneth Copeland, T.D. Jakes. That's the Jesus they want to stop preaching in Israel. But they don't know there's a real Jesus that has the truth. I think they should outlaw Kenneth Copeland in Israel too. I think they ought to outlaw T.D. Jakes. And that's what those men think. They don't know what they're talking about when they say outlawing the preaching of Jesus. Has anybody seen that article on the internet? Huh? I don't see it's how people identify Christianity. They think Christianity is what Kenneth Copeland preaches. When Donald Trump surrounded himself with all these TBN people up the street, he didn't know he was doing the worst thing in the world for his re-election. He had all those charismatic Pentecostals surrounding him, parading with him in Washington. Here's the whole point. If they get to where they outlaw this, it's called the fairness doctrine. You've already got a fairness doctrine in most of the, most of the, uh, uh, the English colonies. You got a lot of that in England. I don't know exactly how much. Do you know how much they've got that where they outlaw the preaching? They say that if you in Canada or any of the United Kingdom's places that if you start running down another person or another preaching, that you can't do that. That's where you can't buy or sell. If they send me, the way I preach, and hard as I preach against Christmas and preach on predestination, if they come up with, with a law saying you cannot run down any other any other believers and they call charismatics believers and they're not that you cannot preach anymore that way I couldn't bring in any money I can't buy and sell it don't mean they won't take your money it means you're not going to have any money to buy and sell and they're getting close to that now can y'all see that they're getting real close to it in America, and they've already got it in a lot of other countries. You can't go to Pakistan or Iran or Iraq and preach this message. They already got it outlawed. If they get it outlawed in America, they'll send a cease and desist order here and say, Jim Brown, stop your message. I wouldn't be surprised because there's too many people hate what I'm preaching. Then I won't be able to buy and sell because there won't be any money coming in. I don't think people understand what the buying and selling is actually about. There's Old Testament shadows about the mark of the beast. I need to... Oh, i got a pain. There's Old Testament... How much time do I have, Mike? 25. 25. There's Old Testament. Let me get me a drink of water. Maybe that'll help. There's an Old Testament. There is a mark of God. And there's a mark of the beast. The... Satan doesn't originate anything. 
He copies God is what he does. I want you to look over here in in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. God is the one that starts all this. Deuteronomy 6. This will show you where they come up with the idea of the mark. Karagma, the characteristic. Satan's characteristics are always smooth talking. That's not, you got to take the, the computer chip in your forehand or in your forehead. That is not what that's talking about. Stupid. First of all, First of all, we got some better computer chips. Now, we got DNA, but it's talking about something stronger than that. It's talking about in the mind. Look here in Deuteronomy 6. I think it, I'm going to keep going over this and coming back to it. Deuteronomy 6. And look, this is where. Satan copies God. Listen to this here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down when you rise up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. It's not talking about putting them actually on your hand. That's where the Pharisees came up with phylacteries. They thought if they'd put these verses, and this is one of the verses they would put on here. I've got some other verses that they put on the phylacteries. They put on they put on the phylacteries. They put uh, this these verses right here. Let me look at the look at my notes here. And they put some other verses in Exodus on the phylacteries. Phylactery meant to protect them. And they would put them on the door of their house, is what it says here. Thou shalt write them up on the post of thy house. They were supposed to go on the right side of the post. I sold a house in real estate one time to a Jew, and he gave me a mezuzah. A mezuzah has these same verses, and you nail it on the right side of the door inside this inside this unit. And it's supposed to protect the house. That's just like the little bike boxes. They think that God is saying, put my law here between your eyes. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about in the mind. And put it on your hand. What do you do with your hand? What are your fans, hand finds to do? Do it with all your might. Do it with all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And do it to the glory of God. That's what the Bible means about that. It's not talking about the literal hand. If your hand offends thee, cut it off. It's talking about reaching out to do the things of Satan and not the things of God. And he says, And it's frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them up on the post of thy house and on thy gates. I've got, I've got a mezuzah over there. Next time you go home, Frank, Look on that front door. I got it on the right hand side of the door. I just stuck it up there so people could ask me, What's that? I said, That's a Mazusa. So I could explain it to her. But I got it over there on Irving. Now, 
let me get into this is God's writing upon his people. There's always when Satan, how long and when did Satan write upon the hearts of his people from the foundation of the world? When did God write upon our hearts? From the foundation of the world. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that's when he he picked us out and wrote upon our hearts. When he wrote upon our hearts, according to the Hebrews, the 10th chapter, he wrote upon fleshy, I mean, wrote upon fleshy tables of our heart in the third chapter of Second Corinthians. Let me show you an Old Testament shadow of God writing upon our hearts, okay? This is a shadow, a skia. It's a shade. The shade is not the real thing. Go over here to Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. You're going to get a picture, a shade in Jeremiah 9. This is going to be a picture of God. This will match up with the seventh chapter of Revelation. Jeremiah 9. Wait a minute, that's Ezekiel 9. That's not Jeremiah 9. No, it's Ezekiel 9. Excuse me. I've got the wrong book. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. This is a shadow. This is not the real thing. This is very figurative language. And perhaps you can see it when I read it. Ezekiel, let's start reading here. Ezekiel 9. Speaking of Jeremiah, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. He's talking about Israel is going to be attacked. He cried, and then he says in verse 2, Behold, six men come from the way of the higher gate, which lieth towards the north. The north, the, the, the temple, he's talking about the temple. The temple faces east. East. This is the north. This is the west. This is the south. He's talking about from this direction. Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side. They went in and stood beside the brazen altar. The brazen altar's here. Stood by the brazen altar. And he has an ink horn, writer's ink horn by his side. Went and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Whereupon he was to, he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen which had the written inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, of the wicked city of Jerusalem, there worshiping all these gods. And through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and they cry, they're weeping, because of the condition of Jerusalem going after these idol gods. They're repentant and cry for the abominations that be done in the midst of them. This is the same gods that were brought into the church by Constantine and renamed the Christ Mass. 
And to the others he said unto mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite, kill. Let not your eyes spare, neither have pity. And you only slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, and come not near any man with whom is the mark. See, God has a mark upon his people. That's when he writes upon our hearts. And he's, he's not going to spare our literal bodies, but he's going to spare the inner man, which is the soul of man. Whom is mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, talking about the temple, and fill the courts with slain men that you've killed, that I'm telling you to kill. And they're the ones that haven't sighed over and been sad over Israel's activities. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, the ones that had the mark of God, they're not going to kill. That's the exact opposite of the mark of the beast. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel and thy pouring out of the fury upon the Jerusalem? This Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Ezekiel's already in the captivity, but God hasn't destroyed Jerusalem yet. Ezekiel was carried away it's believed he was carried away in the captivity in 596 B.C. And Jerusalem is not destroyed until 586 B.C. So this is during the time of Ezekiel. Maybe 595, 94. But Jerusalem is not annihilated yet. Verse 8. Come to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left that I fell upon my face. This is Ezekiel talking. And cried and said, O Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel, and thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? All because they went after sun and tree gods. This is the destruction of Israel here. When you read Ezekiel, and you read Jeremiah, it's about God destroying Israel for their son in tree worship. Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. Over what? Son and tree worship. It's all about that. When you want to read about their destruction, read the 17th chapter of 2 Kings. You'll see the destruction of northern Israel. Read the 36th chapter of Second Chronicles and the 25th chapter of Second Kings. You'll see the destruction of Judah, the southern kingdom. They're slaughtering by the millions because Israel celebrated Christmas under another name 4,000 years ago. And the land is full of blood. This is not talking about pagan land. This is talking about God's people, Israel. The city full of perverseness, for they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. That's how they felt. God was killing them as fast as they came forth. And the Lord seeth not. They're saying, God don't know what's going on. And as for me also, mine I shall not spare, God says. I won't spare anybody. I'll kill your sons and your daughters. I'll have the Assyrians come in, rip the bellies of the mothers open, and dash their brains of their newborn babies, or their unborn babies, dash their brains out on the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. Because you just disgusted. You just turned away from me, God said. This is the exact opposite of the mark of the beast. And I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the men clothed with linen, 
which, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. That was some angel or something. Perhaps it was Michael, the death angel. He killed 185,000 men in one night in the 19th chapter of Second Kings by himself. That's better than Crotty. Huh? Clothed in linen. Yeah. That's right. So this, now, I got so many things to say about this. I don't, how much time do I have, Mike? Nine. Nine minutes. I can say something here at this point. They've just come into the land, overthrow the land. They come in to Jericho. They come in here to Jericho. The next place they go is Ai. They're coming out of 40 years in the wilderness, coming up through the land of Moab, coming up here. The first place they go is Jericho. And then they go up to Ai. Jericho, something miraculous happens. There's, look at Joshua, the second chapter. Joshua, the second chapter. Something happens here that's very familiar, if you know the Old Testament, that happened at the last Passover. There's a young woman. She's a harlot. She's probably a harlot. She's a prostitute because she couldn't make a living any other way. Remember I told you, if the Pharisees came in and said, I divorce you, get out. The only thing that women could do is such a poor land in the first century, they could resort to prostitution. And Jesus said, I am tired of that. You give them half of everything. That's probably why Rahab the harlot was a harlot, because she couldn't make a living. Look here at Joshua, the second chapter. It'll take me a while to go through this. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly. They're coming into the land. They're coming into Jericho. Saying, to view the land, even Jericho. They're spying because Jericho is ruled by a bunch of heathens. And they went and came into the harlot's house named Rahab and stayed at the harlot's house. Rahab makes a deal with these spies. She says, you can stay in my house. I won't tell anybody you're here. I just want you to save my family. And she ends up being a believer. This will show you the grace of God. Because when you look at the first chapter of Matthew, I'm coming back to this chapter. Look at the first chapter of Matthew. Rahab is in the lineage of of Christ in the first chapter of Matthew. And she's a harlot. Shows you the grace of God is what it shows you. First chapter of Matthew. And Judas, verse 3. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob. Now, to Judah would come the king. That's why this takes you all the way down to Jesus, the king. And out of Judah beget Pharez and Zerah and Tamar. And Pharez beget Eshram. And Eshram beget Aram. 
and Aram begat Amenadab, Amenadab begat Naasan, and Naasan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. It says Rahab, but it's Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. It shows you the grace of God through this entire lineage of Jesus. You got a harlot, and you got a you got a Moabite woman in in Christ's lineage. Well, that wouldn't fit with a royal family, would it? <laughs> wouldn't accept that at all. And Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David, who would be the eternal king. Now let's go back to Rahab over here. I may cut this short and then come back and cover it. So Rahab makes a deal. And she lets down these two spies in verse 15. Let them down by a cord through a window of her house and was upon the town wall. And they had promised her that they would spare her because she has housed them and kept them sacred. And she dwelt upon the wall, and she said unto them, Get you into the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. This is a harlot protecting the spies of God. And hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers return, and afterward you may go your way. And the men said unto her, He will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear, behold, when we come into the land to attack with the army, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet, it says thread, it means a scarlet or red, a red cord. It's a red cord, a blood red cord. In the window which thou didst let us down by, that thou bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street. The same thing he said about the first Passover in Exodus 12. If you leave the house and you leave the protection of that house, if you go outside in the street while this 10th plague is coming over Egypt in Exodus 12, you'll die. He's saying the same thing here. And he says in Exodus 12, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. And he says to Rahab the harlot, when I see the red-blooded cord, I will pass over this house and everybody in this house will be spared. Same thing as Exodus 12. When I see the red cord, whoever's in the house will not die. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of the house into the street, his blood shall be upon his own head and you'll die. Stay in the house. Just like the Passover. Stay in the house. The blood has to be over the doorpost. This has to do with the blood baptism. Jesus didn't say, He didn't say, This blood is, this water is the New Testament in my blood. He said, This blood is the New Testament. He didn't say, this water hath made thee whole. He said, the blood of Christ is made you whole. And we will be guiltless. Whoever will be with thee in the house of his blood shall be on our head if any hand be upon him. If thou utter this our business, then we will be quit will be innocent of thine oath and thou hast made us to swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. I'll have a red rope hanging out of the house, just like blood. When I see the blood red rope, 
I'll pass over this house. When I see the blood, I'll pass it. When I see the blood baptism on your hearts, he sprinkled our hearts. He passes over. I've run out of time. I got a lot more to say on this. I got so many things to say about this blood baptism. That is our salvation. It's not water. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. I got more we're going to go into about this. The shadows all through the Old Testament. A blood baptism is true baptism. That's the same thing as that cord. That's the same thing as the blood around the board, the post of the house. That's the same thing as the pitch of the ark. The fact that your body's, that your heart's been pitched with blood, that's a death. You have to have a death and you have to be growing in that. The longer you live, the more you'll die daily. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. This thing is getting overwhelming to me. Help us to understand your mark is your name. That's your character. Thank you for truth. I pray that you'll give us strength to continue doing everything. Open up doors for the ministry. We'll give you praise for everything. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I was stumbling on that one. I hope I... Good. Yeah, it was a stumbling, though. I'd never preached it that way before. It is the name. The mark is the name. The Bible says so. Huh? I was talking about that the other day. The one in Ezekiel is for our benefit. The one in Revelation is for our hurt. Yeah, that's right. And he's, he was a priest because he had the linen clothes on and he had the ink on and he went into the temple. He yeah. had to be a priest. Yeah. Anything that's inside the inside the uh, inside the temple proper has to be Levites. Only Levites could go in there. I stumbled through that. Yeah, I was stumbling through that. I was stumbling because I was hurting. My side's hurting. Do we have a top to this? You said, when he said, what is it? Well, let us make us a name is the mark. That's the mark of Babylon. I'll have to say that more to really get a hold of it myself. Jenny, Moody, and I started Grace's Reason at the same time. Do you eat it? No. Downstairs in your office. Um, you show it to me. Oh, yeah. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Wasn't included in that. I got one. 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 I got
It's amazing how that works. And I just found out you just got chills that it goes along with the soil. Yeah, it does. Yeah. When we speak of righteous words, like you say, oh, the righteous words. Why do you say righteous words? What's not a righteous word? I like the word. How do we do it? I mean, I am not pro It can't be predestined for that. No. All right. So, in other words, I understand that the righteousness of the Look at the word "word." Find the word "word" in nature. It's it's urban. That's a problem. Every time you find a word, it's talking about the Jews doing the Jews. I know he heard it. I heard that. Rod Stewart. Yeah. I hate is, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go. Oh, 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 my God. I don't see that. I don't know. 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 And there he asked me if I dyed my hair blonde. Oh, and I said, uh, it's no, I don't dye my hair. <laughs> Yeah. She said the last time she saw me, she said, if you ever have a chance to do it, you can do it. 
Can we go like the one that's in the uh, uh, Strong's uh, one study? One more recording? It's just a couple of guys. Four. Four. It's just a couple of guys. We have a big shot. 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 We have a big shot